Dames en heren, goede, goede middag. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. At the last official section of the day, it's an honor for me to be here and address you from two perspectives. The first is that I'm pleased to succeed Chris Andiers as our chairman of the day. And it's also an honor because based on the scientific council for the it, Dutch Fire Department, I'm, I'm going to be able to present an award. But first, I have some general remarks. We had scheduled a presentation of Naomi Rose. Rose. Unfortunately, we cannot um, present that. So that's been canceled. As for the presentations by the candidates, we'll have two live ones. And the idea was to receive videos of two presentations. We'll be able to view one. The other was submitted, but cannot be screened for technical reasons. The jury was able to view it, so that candidate will continue to be nominated, but we're unable to screen that presentation for you. So that means that we'll be hearing presentations by Sandra Dalbani, Rod Krillart, and Carmen uh, Puczynska. We'll be watching those in a moment. So I propose that we um, get down to brass tacks and start the presentation. This may mean that we'll finish a bit earlier, but we'll have more time for networking, and that's also very useful. Okay, Sander, you have the floor. Where are you? There you are. I'd say um, go, go for it. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sander Junta Dalbani, and I've been invited to deliver a presentation based on my graduation last November, so that's a while ago. But so I, I've been nominated nonetheless. It's a graduation presentation from the uh, Technical University of Eindhoven. My supervisors were Professor Brauder Sudut from Erpa and Ricardo Weaver. Let me walk you through what I'm going to talk about. There's an introduction, uh, literature, research, and part of the research proposal based on the literature research a test set up, the um, mass loss experiments and the simulations. The research was initiated by the Dutch Fire Department. They asked how about uh, synthetic insulator materials used at fires in the Netherlands. We see things and we want to know more about that, those. So they envisage a potential hazard to firefighters entering the scene and think that these uh, materials might uh, increase the intensity of the fire, and there might be uh, explosions uh, from smoke gas as well. Those are their questions. I have listed that on the sandwich panels. There's a huge insulation uh, fire, and we uh, examine the sa sandwich panels because they're lightweight, uh, have a lot of insulation capacity and large spans. We tested the PUR, the PIR, and the stone wool. There was a lot of literature about uh, EPS, but we didn't include it in the study because it's no longer manufactured in the Netherlands and th is therefore no longer used in new buildings. As for the uh, temperature span I based my study on, that's from ambient up to 400 degrees. I deliberately selected this because in that area there may be, in that range of temperature, there may be some survivors in a building. And af when you exceed that temperature, there are no more survivors. You, you switch to flash over and the entire area is lost. Well, it, there's no use to um, uh, determining smoke gas because it's already burning. As for the results from the literature research, there was poor joint detailing which leads to rapid delamination of the panels. And that means that uh, the flame uh, spreads pretty quickly. And standard SBI tests presently conducted are too small to see whether buckling affects the um, joint detailing. So the SBI test, according to Mrs. Messerschmidt, is insufficient at this time and research is needed to explore what happens with the migration of products, combustions behind metal faces, 
of combustible cord sandwich panels because there may be a flash over by one by firing one area to another area that emerged from the literature research. And based on practice, the smoke gas explosion because of synthetic insulation materials are possible, and these panels might transport gases to the fire if they if they're pyrolyzed so from another area toward the fire, so that increases the um, fire burden, the fire load. So we decided to conduct uh, large-scale research. And after speaking with the fire department again, we thought it might be a good idea to start with small samples to see what the material really does, rather than uh, starting with a, a large um, sample. And if risks emerge, then you could always examine more extensive testing. The research proposal is whether a sandwich panel produces enough pyrolysis when it's exposed to temperature ranges between 100 to 400 de degrees to reach the a flammability limit. That's when the um, when there are enough um, uh, combustible substances to uh, catch flame. And if you're below that temperature threshold, then the fire won't start. So I tried out mass, mass loss by simulating a fire in the pre-flash over stage and combining the results. These are the areas I considered. I conducted the tests at 150, 250, and 350 degrees centigrade. 150 at that moment was, the, was where the uh, glue would be released from the panel. And 350 was the highest possible temperature for the extinguishing staff to be present. So the sim simulation temperature intervals were 100 to 200, 201 to 300, and 301 to 400. I determined the upper threshold based on radiation uh, to which um, the firefighter is exposed. And what I determined was that the maximum radiation is 8 kilowatts per square meter. And if you do the numbers, you reach 350 degrees as the result. This is the uh, test arrangement that I used. We've um, drafted it. This is a very simple uh, gas concrete arrangement in this setup. And we heat a sample. It's uh, self-designed and self-built. And, and we uh, insert uh, a rack with the sandwich mill. We ins insulate it and radiate it and measure the temperature on and beneath the sample with the um, radiation beneath the sample. And we measure the uh, air temperature inside and outside. And after 10 minutes of being exposed to the constant temperature of 150, 250, and 350 degrees. This is what it looks like. So that's the drawer containing the sample. And this is uh, three centimeters from the exposed surface and the ambient temperature. So you can take, you can simulate the uh, smoke layer in a building against your panel that way. And if you have a fire, then you've got the external temperature as the ambient temperature. These are all the tests plotted in a graph, so you can see how consistent the results were. Each time we were able to keep it relatively flat, so that means that the setup was reliable. Now the results in a stone old roof panel. You see the fire here. This is the um, the depth of the burn, and you can see that in the uh, roof panels, in the samples, and the wool wall. And they were exposed to 350 degrees for 10 minutes. You can see that this one is all gone, and the stone wool discolors. The glue layer, the adhesive layer, is gone. And you see the same imprint in the panel on all samples. If you plot the results in a graph, this is what you end up with. And we can see that the PUR panels are at the bottom. And after once at 250 degrees, then suddenly the threshold is at 270 degrees, then they react and start pyrolyzing and gasify. The stone wool remains a st steady line. and. PUR is in between the two. What's most striking is that they think that the st stone wool panels are not flammable, whereas they think that the synthetic ones are. And you can see that the PUR panels 
the art in between. It's not as cut and dry as you would have said at the start. This is what I use for my simulations. So the red surface is the mass carried in the simulations. That's the area that the panel that participated in the pyrolysis. I simulated various uh, sheds, cooling sheds, and I selected those because the um, fire behavior is slower there, and I also uh, simulated this in a poultry shed. I did the simulation in ozone, which is a simulation program combined with the experiments. That's the result of my experiments. And I combined those with the results of Luke's experiments. He's a co-worker of mine conducting research at the same time. And I plotted everything in an Excel sheet and crunched the numbers. We can skip that one. So that is how we can show that at the temperature of 300 degrees, there's 6% uh, pyrolyzed material in a clean smoke layer. And only when you get to 400 or 350 degrees do you head to 10 or 11%, whereas the threshold uh, in the other research indicated 39%. And we wanted to argue about that. But when I relate the two to each other, it shows that based exclusively on the insulation um, materials. We don't get to that explosive gas layer in the sandwich panels. And the simulations are based on a worst case scenario, ventilation controlled fire. So a large area this, with a small fire, no apertures. So the, all pyrolyzing materials remain inside the building. And we capped the simulations at 400 degrees. We did not take into account what would happen at hotter temperatures. And the results show the percentages that I just told you about and smoke uh, free heights ranging from three to four meters. So most uh, buildings were eight meters high, and then half of the building would be smoke filled. And there's a limit to our experiments. We didn't test mechanical behavior. It used only constant temperature, temperature, so not a normal uh, fire conduct. And we used long exposure to a constant temperature, but it won't remain constant for a long time in a normal fire. And as for smoke layers, I, I assume that they were e equally divided throughout the premises. So if it's 10 centimeters here, it should be 10 centimeters across the room. S same for a one meter thickness of the smoke layer. And it's a conventional calculation, so it approximates reality. You can't uh, determine this exactly. All materials degrade uh, under higher temperatures. PR panels have the highest rate of mass loss at the end of the simulations, although they do not, do not react until they reach temperatures close to 300 degrees. P, uh, PIR and stonewall panels follow similar patterns in the pre-flashover phases, but if you expose them to 350 degrees, then the bottom steel board will disengage in PIR and stonewall panels. PUR uh, cores will pyrolyze completely if exposed to heat for a long time. Simulations show that flammable mi mixtures in the smoke layer during the pre-flashover phase are not plausible due to only pyrolysis of sandwich panel cores. During the offensive fire repression where temperatures up to 350 degrees Celsius, uh, mass percentages do not exceed 22.6%. Uh, and cooled and small roof-angled buildings um, are at increased risk. And that happens. That was my presentation. There you are. Ja, Sander, uh, dank je wel voor je heldere presentatie. Het is uh, gelegenheid. Thank you for your clear presentation. We'll take some questions. Does anybody have any questions? Question off mic, inaudible to interpreter. Deliberately to examine the risk to firefighters in the building at that moment. If you check at higher temperatures, I showed in my calculations, it's not very likely that anybody will remain alive in that building so that you, you wouldn't enter the building. That's why we capped the temperature at 400 degrees. Other questions? Question off mic, inaudible to interpreter. Dan zou het wel kunnen. 
then it would be possible, yes. We didn't change anything else about the contents of the building. We didn't consider uh, chairs or um, wood or carpeting, just the panels. We considered only what happened to the panels. Any more questions? Question inaudible. Question on mic. What I did with the panel was I weighed it before and after, and that's the result of the mass loss in the product, and the rest has been pyrolyzed. The assumption is that the mass loss has been converted into pyrolyzed gases. Any other questions? Yes. Question off mic, inaudible. No, I didn't show that here. That's the study. All the onderzoeken, yeah. All those studies. Okay, you. Question off mic. Well, the final conclusion is that the cooling sheds and flat roofs, it may be because of the model that I based my calculations and because I div distributed the thickness throughout the smoke layer. And the less the slope of your roof is, the faster the entire smoke layer affects the roof. So if you have a sloped roof, then it will um, concentrate in a small surface. But if you have a, a flat roof, it's going to affect the in entire roof surface. Question off mic. That's true, but to crunch the numbers, you need to base it on some assumptions. That's why I did it that way. Well, you can use a combination as well. Question was off mic. Well, that's a practical answer. Another question over here. And the question is off mic. There is an elevated risk of accumulation of uh, pyrolyzed gas in the smoke layer. So there's an elevated uh, risk of a flammable mixture. And at a cooling shed, that's because the entire temperature of the air is lower. So it takes longer to elevate the temperature. Well, I don't know if that would happen. I can't tell you that. That would be a follow-up study. Okay, I'm looking around the room. Yes, okay. Well, Sander, thank you very much for your presentation. And we'll continue with Roy Krilaj's presentation. Roy, where are you? You have the floor. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my presentation. I have been asked to talk for about 10 to 15 minutes about my graduation, my thesis, self-extinguishment of cross-laminated timber. I did this research at the Technical University of Delft, along with Effectis and Arup, an engineering agency, where I am working already at the London offices. So this is a short overview of my presentation. As you see, I will be concentrating a bit more on the experiments and a bit less on possible implications of my findings. Should you have any questions about that, I'd like to hear about the questions after the presentation. Let me start with a brief introduction into the subject. You may have noticed that over the past few years, there's an increased interest in uh, high-rise buildings in timber. And this has got to do towards a shift towards um, uh, 
uh, sustainable architecture, but also the development of engineered timber products, one of which you will see here, which is CLT, cross-laminated timber. Actually, they are thick planks of wood that are cross-laminated. You can make a big, thick packet of that and make planks um, that are quite sizable. And CLT is used for construction walls and, flower fl and, and floors in all sorts of buildings. Now, we've seen these kind of proposals quite a number of times over the past few years, 34 stories, quite a high rise tower for the city of Stockholm. And here CLT is applied as a load bearing, load bearing walls and floors. So if we look at the actual building in CLT, we see that there's quite a gap in the height that is realized, in fact. And one of the main challenges, which is, of course, one of the reasons I'm here, is that wood is flammable. Now, this is quite, there's quite a difference with the conventional materials that we use in high-rise buildings. The fact that the material is, is flammable entails a number of uncertainties in terms of the behavior of the material in case of a fire. We don't have any precedents. We don't have any examples of high-rise buildings that burn. So we really can't fall back on experience. So people are quite skeptical about it, and quite rightly so. Is that a reason, then, not to go ahead and build with this material? I don't think so. In any case, I think it's a good reason to do research, which is exactly what I did for my graduation. A number of challenges, and one of them is uh, the behavior of the construction and the burnout scenario it has been touched on today. The idea is to have the construction survive this, the fire completely, and we're going to use timber as a construction material. So we have large surfaces of unprotected wood, unprotected CLT. So if there's a, bur a, a fire in this space, you can expect CLT floors and walls to burn along. At a certain point in time, the fire load in that space, including the construction itself, will have burned out. The question is whether the wooden construction will continue to burn or whether it is capable of self-extinguishing. And that is a drawback of building high-rise. If the construction itself starts burning, I mean, you might think that the structure might collapse, which, of course, is the, something you don't want for high-rise. So we need to get, have more understanding of constructive uh, fire safety. My question is, under which conditions is there a potential of self-extinguishment of CLT? To answer this question, we're going to look at a bit of theory. How does the material burn? And I set up a quite a straightforward model in which we can look into that. We start with the unprotected CLT space with an initial fire, and as a consequence, CLT burns along in a flaming fire. At some point, the fire in that compartment or the fire load is com consumed, and you see that CLT um, the floors and the walls start smoldering. But in order to get to the last step to self-extinguishment, there are a number of conditions, which is sufficient layers of uh, heat radiation, thermal radiation, and uh, a favorable airflow. Because if we build a fire outside, we put all these pieces of wood together, and they radiate, and they smolder, and they keep the fire going. Because if I take one log out, the fire will extin extinguish, so the heat flux so if you blow into a fire, it has a certain impact, so we understand the working thereof. CL2T has, consists of layers, and that leads to uh, another additional problem, which is delamination. And wood carbonizes when it burns, which is a, a favorable feature, but if the carbon layer reaches the adhesive, the adhesive layer can uh, fall off and new wood will be exposed to the fire. And so that messes things up. And that can lead to the fact that this transition cannot be made. So my idea is that if we make sure that the layers in CLT are thicker, we may be able to postpone the fact that the carbon layer reaches the adhesive layer, and that way we can go through this schedule. And that led to an additional condition. And this is a schedule that I researched in my test. In the first series of experiments, I focused on this latter step, which is the step from smoldering to self-extinguishing as a consequence of airflow and thermal radiation. And what we did 
was mod we modeled the CLT fire as a two-step radiation, really, high radiation in the full-fledged fire. And then the fire, or the initial uh, fire load has been consumed. And all you have then is the CLT that radiates. And that is what we research in the second lower radiation. We look at the levels, and we also look at the additional air stream in the surface, at which value does the CLT self-extinguish, and at which value does it continue to burn? That's what we looked at. And this is some footage to show the experiment. Here you see this small piece of CLT with which I did the experiments. And here it's exposed to the high level of radiation. And so these are the conditions in a full, fully developed fire. And what you see is that immediately flammable gases are emitted and there's burn because the, co the carbon layer hasn't built up yet. And once it's 20 millimeters thick, I decided to switch over to a second radiation panel where we have a lower level that has been set. The lower level represents the CLT walls and floors that radiate onto each other once the initial fire has been extinguished. And depending on the level of radiation and the airflow, the block will continue to burn or it will extinguish. And the conclusion then was that there is a potential for self-extinguishing, but the value of radiation has to be below 5 to 6 kilowatt per square meter, and the airflow has to be limited to 0.5 meter per second, which is rather low. It's something that we really have to reflect on. But in these experiments, the effect of delamination has not been taken into account because these blocks were placed horizontally. And that's something I did in my second series of tests. In the second series, I looked at the entire schedule, including the influence and the impact of the thickness of the layers and the possible effect of delamination. And the setup of this test was to build a small compartment and to start a propane fire, an initial fire, in the space excluding the construction. And CLT starts to burn along. At some point, the propane fire uh, stops, decays, the initial fire decays, and then the question is whether CLT continues to burn, yes or no. And then I have here the, the amount of CLT that is unprotected, but also the thickness of the layer. I stop the propane fire after 20 millimeters of burning, and there's some variation in the thickness of layer in order to research the effect of delamination. And here I again have some footage to show you what we did. Here you see the entry of the small compartment, the propane fire is ignited, and the CLT starts to burn rather quickly. And here you see the severity of the fire with only the propane burners, the initial fire in the compartment here in the room. But quickly, you see that the wood starts burning as well, and we have a contribution from CLT towards the fire. The wood has carbonized to a certain extent, and then the propane fire decays, and the question is what CLT is going to do on, its, at it, on itself. And this is a picture of a test with 20 millimeters um, thickness, and you see that the carbon layer has reached the adhesive layer, and you see quite a bit of delamination. You see that there's a lot of carbon on the floor. And this was ultimately the result in which the burners have been switched off. Uh, but the CLT, because layers upon layers fall off and new timber is exposed to the fire, it sort of self-propagates. And here you see a picture of carbon, and you see all these different layers. One by one, the layers fallen off the CLT. And you see this back in the results. And here we see a temperature graph. The propane fire is stopped, and the temperature does drop. At different points in time, there are significant amounts of carbon that drop off. And as a consequence, the fire continues. We also had tests in which this dropped quite considerably. But because of delamination, there was a sort of second flashover of the compartment. So delamination can uh, fire the fire and the CLT will burn out. 
We also did tests with 40 millimeters thick wood. And again, CLT burned along with the initial fire. But all this carbon stayed put quite nicely. This uh, carbon layer didn't really reach the adhesive layer, and CLT started smoldering when the propane burners had been switched off. And ultimately, it died out. And this is a result that you get. Uh, I think this is a wonderful picture in which you can see the carbon very nicely. And you see it also reflected in the graph. The propane fire stopped, and then you see one nice straight line towards ambient temperature. The, the adhesive layer was not reached. There's no delamination. And ultimately, the, what we saw was self-extinguishing. Delamination is very important in the fire behavior. CLT sustains the flaming, or even can make sure that the fire goes from smoldering to flaming. So ultimately, the construction could collapse because uh, it won't survive the burnout. So the idea is to prevent delamination with sufficiently thick top layers. And then you reach the smoldering phase, and you return to the first set of experiments. And in the smoldering phase, you have to comply with these conditions in order to be able to achieve self-extinguishing. Conclusions. Indeed, there is a potential for a self-extinguishing CLT, provided a number of conditions are met. Preventing delamination with sufficiently thick layers and making sure that in the smoldering phase, the heat flux remains limited to five to six kilowatt per square meter and making sure that the airflow remains sufficiently low. And this can be a point here because it is quite a low airflow. By way of conclusion, wood burns and uh, concrete spoils and steel quickly loses strength at high uh, temperatures. I believe that each and every material has its uh, pros and cons, and it is up to us as engineers and designers to manage these risks. And understanding of the structural fire behavior, including potential for self-extinguishment, could ultimately perhaps contribute to uh, using wood as a safe material in high-rise buildings. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Roy, for this very clear and interesting presentation. So once again, we um, have the possibility to ask questions. So who would like to kick off with a question at the back? Question off mic. The interpreter can't hear the question. Yeah, close. And uh, the answer to the honourable question is yes, that's correct. It's very interesting to look at uh, the airspeed. I mean, we're talking about high high rise here. The twentieth uh, floor, the uh, glazing will have broken because of the fire. What can you expect then? I mean, the air flux. Uh, I only included it to a certain extent. Some. I will admit as much because uh, during the experiments I was thinking, hey, I would like uh, to really include that. And I did some indicative tests. My conclusion there was that it does have quite an impact. And yes, it's one, it was one of my recommendations to look into that in further detail because the heat radiation, five to six, is a value depending on the configuration and the uh, and in this, the space that you could change, but the air flow, yeah, that could be a deal breaker. Yes, indeed. Now, um, CLT, is CLT is available in all sorts of thicknesses, but if you look at the thickness that is applied in floors, you see that there are other things that uh, play a part, such as vibration of these floors. And you know, if you have a surface of four to five meters, it's not extraordinary to have a thickness of the floor of 216 millimeters, perhaps. So particularly as a consequence, or, or for, for reasons of acoustics and vibration, so 
When we build in wood construction, uh, acoustics, vibration of the flower, and fire are actually the driving forces, and that you apply thicker outer layers, that's a good thing for the construction. It's favorable because in the outer layers, you find the fibers of the wood that you need to have in the, in the direction of the surface. So in terms of construction, it may be favorable, but it's quite correct. And even if you want to move towards stricter uh, fire prevention uh, requirements, Interruption without a mic, the interpreter can't hear. Uh, yeah, now, yeah, in beton. Uh, well, yes, in concrete, yes. Uh, yeah, we could do that uh, thinner, possibly if you do it in two directions. You cover the surface in two directions. Less than 20 centimeters thickness would be possible. Dan zit je met dezelfde geluid. Yes, and then you have the same acoustic requirements, but wood vibration, particularly, will determine the thickness of the. We're going to do things differently because the interpreters, I just heard that the interpreters can't hear the questions that are asked, so I'm just going to use a microphone. My question is whether you considered, or you considered to do this test setup, and what about horizontal, vert vertical load instead of only horizontal load? Did you consider that? Yes, absolutely. In the first test that I showed you, vertical load was not possible for practical reasons. I mean, the equipment couldn't, couldn't do it. That was the equipment that I had uh, that was available to me. But that was precisely the reason why in the second series of tests, there were all walls. And that is particularly a vertical setup. So, or vertical exposure. And until recently, the idea was that delamination did take place, but not vertically. The tests have been done in Switzerland, where the exposure was from from the bottom to top, uh, and we thought, okay, if we apply it uh, vertically, it won't be as bad, but it wasn't. Other questions? If you have a thick top layer, wouldn't you be dealing with solid wood? And don't you think we already know a lot about solid wood? Well, yes, it would simulate the behavior solid wood if you if you won't if you don't encounter a layer of adhesive yes that's correct and there are also other reasons to nonetheless use clt because you have these layers cross-linked layers so you have capacity in the different directions and that uh, is favorable for constructive and structural reasons Yes, but the behavior, the fire behavior, was not known from literature for solid timber. Yes, yeah, for ordinary timber, yes, we have lots of research. But if you apply a CLT, and particularly the impact of the adhesive layer, that was something that hadn't been sufficiently researched. And also the potential for self-extinguishing. I mean, that had hardly been researched. There is quite a bit of research into was how much radiation, radiation does the timber start burning, but not with, with how much radiation will it extinguish. The five to six in that context was a new found finding. So that means that I have to take a walk. Well, you have an assumption now for the time, the duration of the initial fire. You have two thicknesses in your assumption. Did you look at whether this time span is realistic? Because if the initial fire takes more time, you'll, you'll require more thickness. Well, to do a proper comparison between the tests, I mean, you could compare it in different ways. You could say, I will start the exact same fire each and every time because I was looking for the effect of delamination. I said, okay, I'm going to wait until the 20 millimeters is burnt in. And if I calculate that, and I did, I did that, if I calculate how much energy I put into the compartment, that tallied nicely with the uh, values in the Euro code for office, uh, for in offices, for instance, the heat release lease rate, the total fuel load. And so uh, that was uh, more or less the same. But it wasn't a deliberate choice. Other questions? 
at the back. The reaction of uh, Sean de Crane because he has uh, got very uh, a, l a lot of information about uh, self combustible materials in, in buildings. Maybe he can give some kind of reaction on what he saw. Sure. Are you willing to? Unfortunately, I'm at a little, Unfortunately, I'm at a little disadvantage here because uh, I didn't grab a headset. <laughs> <laughs> so. I was sitting trying to translate here, but uh, I'm not doing so well. But this is an issue that's important to us. And my only, uh, and my only question is, looking at this and just kind of watching it, it seemed like it was a small sample sizing in, in your testing. And again, uh, not, not to criticize, I'm not criticizing whatsoever, but we're in a position where we're taking small samples and then trying to extrapolate that information out to real world application. And uh, it's, it's not necessarily that the American Fire Service is against CLTs, but we'd like to see some real full-scale application tests so we understand exactly its contribution to the fuel load and does it overcome what our hand lines can, can overcome going down that hallway before we put it up nine stories, 30 stories in the air. So those are some of the challenges we have. And also, uh, as you're looking at this self-extinguishment, What's the contribution of a fully loaded apartment and sustaining that fuel load on the CLT? I, I, you probably can't answer that here, so I, I didn't want to put that in front of you. Okay, well, I, I know there are some experiments being done uh, on larger scale. Uh, obviously, within the scope of the master thesis, um, this was quite um, the maximum I could do. Uh, but I agree with you, and that was also one of the major remarks I put in my conclusions that uh, I was already quite happy with the scale of these mini compartments. Um, but yeah, before, you, before I would confidently extrapolate some of these conclusions, I would definitely recommend larger scale uh, testing as well. Um, but the problem is with a lot of the large scale testing that they often stop it at a certain time, either to protect the facility or because like they met a certain fire resistance uh, duration and then stop the test. And the nice thing about um, this opportunity was that I really uh, investigated, you know, even after and, and see uh, in the end is it able to, to self extinguish. So that is, you know, that's the, the payoff. And I was going to grab you afterwards, so I'm sorry. Of course. <laughs> Please do. Okay, I'm just looking around to the audience. I remember that a long time ago when I was studying to become a fire commander, second class, I think uh, there was a, a fire speed of four centimeters an hour. And my question is, that's still correct. But the more interesting question is, if we have these new structures, CLT materials, can you still use a rule of thumb like that? Yes, well, it was quite rightly said that if you have thicker layers, actually, you would simulate Solid wood, that's correct. The burning of CLT follows the Euro code recommendation of 0.7 or 0.65 millimeters per minute. But as soon as delamination, delamination occurs, I mean, the numbers go up, all of a sudden the carbon layer falls off, you lose that protection, and since new timber is exposed to the fire, you have another effect of the additional inf flammable gases. And so the Eurocode does offer pointers for protected wood structures in which the protection falls or disappears, where you have a, a burning which is twice as high. And this is an effect you can apply to CLT if you expect these thinner layers or CLT. Thank you. Yeah, I think I that you graag vragen had willen stellen, maar dat. Sure, you would have loved to answer to ask questions, but you'll have to send her an email. Very well. That takes us to the moment where the jury is going to deliberate, and that will give Erik Janssen of the Association of Fire Safety Advisors to elaborate on how we came to nominate these candidates. So, Erik, you have the floor, and w the jury will now deliberate. Thank you. 
Goedemiddag. Um, ik heb een uh, korte presentatie. I have a brief presentation. What's nice is that most of the nominees have been presented, so there are no more surprises. They were actually presented in Eindhoven about a month ago. How did we come up with these nominees? Three members of the Association of Biosafety Advisors considered this. Those are uh, the Dejimir Niemann and myself. DGMR Niemann and myself. These are the members, and these members are dedicated to providing good quality counsel, and they try to coordinate various things so that we don't hold each other accountable for details, but that we try to um, maintain a certain level of knowledge. We also try to convey knowledge to the public. So on 17 November, I, I'm pleased to announce an afternoon of lectures in Ada where you'll be able to listen to several interesting lectures. So please check the VVBA website, and you might want to attend. There's still some uh, places available, spots available. So if you want to register, please do. Now, what's the objective at the um, thesis award? We had to select the best matcher, master of bachelor graduation thesis concerning fire safety in the Netherlands and Flanders, innovative, speech-making, relevant, fundamental, and there's an amount of money that comes with it. The VVBA nominates and then the IFV, together with uh, Ruud von Hert, tries to determine who wins the award. Well, it's lovely to say I'll be happy to do that, but when you receive 18 graduation papers, that's quite a shock. The committee uh, made an advanced selection, and then of the seven papers, Peter van der Leur of DGMR and I nominated for the criteria are currency, the approach, how has the study been approached, the depth. Quite honestly, I might be overplaying my hand when I hear those uh, lectures but we're basically interested in research of a certain depth. And then the conclusions that were reached, what their use will be, are, is the graduation paper innovative? Is it applicable? And then the presentation matters too. Before I present some sheets with findings and recommendations that might reflect some criticism, I'd also like to say, but I didn't coordinate this with Peter, that w if I consider the graduation papers 10 years ago and compare those with the ones today, it's been a quantum leap forward. And as we disseminate knowledge in the Netherlands, those graduation papers are becoming more and more serious. And sometimes I wonder why I didn't have the time to sort this out myself and write it down. So as a former person at the uh, TNO Institute, sometimes my mouth is watering at the research. And the scope of the award makes for a uh, huge uh, difference in levels. Some of them are bachelor's and other are master's papers. Some are working on the fire safety engineering, for example, in Edinburgh, Ghent, or Lund. Some take three months, others take six months. And you can understand that that leads to differences as well. It's nice that a lot of the work is applied, but we have one more recommendation for whoever will need to um, advise such projects in the future, because sometimes um, politics enter the picture. And the researcher in me says you still need to qualify subtle differences and convey them. And sometimes you see certain assumptions or choices that have not 
been explicit, made explicit, and you wonder whether this is perhaps not from the student, but from the principal or the advisor. So if you're uh, the advisor for one of these projects, try to consider this, because that's something we need to learn as well. And sometimes the uh, source listings are very brief. Sometimes they're not properly investigated. One of the nominees seems to be very independent about how he interacts with everybody around him. And he uh, charted his own course. Sometimes we feel that we fail to consider the, re the answers when you perform measurements, you realize that the accuracy leaves something to be desired. You have to consider measurement errors. And when you crunch the numbers, you have to ask yourself, is this how I should really present it? Or should I think more carefully about potential errors and uncertainties? And we'd like being a bit more active in the Netherlands. And we'd like to um, do more with our own computational models. Sometimes you see a certain black box approach. They're wonderful pieces of research, but people simply insert something and see what comes out. Now, you just saw a presentation from a Polish lady who studied in Edinburgh. I don't think there were any Dutch people in the acknowledgments or anybody from Flanders. We'd like to circumscribe this more carefully for next year so that the um, link with the Netherlands and Flanders is properly stated. Well, that's the future. The four nominations, as you saw, Ms. Gorska wrote about smoldering turf. It was quite complicated. I was trying to see whether I understood everything, but it's very fundamental. You can see that. Then we saw this presentation, and in that minefield of opinions that prevails in the Netherlands, we appreciated the how the critique from external sources was taken into consideration and processed. And then we wondered whether this would be the final response based on input from other studies. We also just heard from Roy Krilart, and that's exactly the question from the audience, from Leuven, of course. Do you want to think carefully about the fire load when the inventory is still burning? Will that affect the thickness of the uh, top laminate? And yes, half a meter per second. That's not complete yet. But Mr. Krila clearly understood that. And that's one of the uh, charms of the presentation. Then there's another study that was not presented about combining sprinklers and RWA. And one of the interesting things for us as consulting firms is that you see somebody, that somebody took the time to think carefully about whether they get the numbers right and try to relate them to things we really do know, so relate them to experiments. And that may be a baby step, but there's no general conclusion that has everything done and dusted it, but it is a very s secure baby step that they take. And I'd like to wrap up on that note and invite the jury. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to try to carry out this very difficult cast. Uh, the winners. We're going to do this for the fourth time. But we also have previous winners. 2012, it was Rob Smates. 
with the response times at residential or home uh, fires, and he wrote a book on fire safety engineering, 2013, Brecht de Brouwer, study on initial fire behavior, low, uh, low energy houses, University of Ghent, fire safety engineering conferences, um, was uh, where he spoke. And then in 2014, Thijs Geertsma uh, slamming the brake to uh, response times for Saxion Hochschule, and he has focused on training on fire safety engineering. Okay, so the panel for the award, the panel consists of Ruth von Herber, Technical University of Eindhoven, Ricardo Weaver, the um, fire um, academy, and I myself as chair, and Ms. Hacher was uh, secretary of our panel. So, Eric, uh, you have just said a few words about the 20 theses that have been submitted that we had a pre-selection, but it just goes to show if you have 20 submissions, it's uh, something everybody's interested in and an increasing number of people are interested in every year. The panel has looked into the nominated thesis and the aspects that Eric has just explained and uh, judge the thesis on the innovative nature of the thesis, the interest um, of the subjects, and also the scientific substantiation ap and application for the um, fire brigade. Conclusion is that all four theses are excellent. They're excellent scientific research, and every year you see that uh, they um, step up their efforts a bit. There are small nuances in their grading. Some researches were experimental and difficult. Others were rather theoretical. And if we look at the significance f of research uh, for fire safety, there are differences in the thesis from less relevant to extremely relevant. So that. Uh, is the reason why this is so difficult. But then again, you know that this is always a challenge. Ultimately, we feel that uh, the applicability for fire uh, prevention is important. All four theses are very relevant to this field of work, some directly and some perhaps in the future at a later point in time. But the thesis, all of the theses, contain interesting statements and deserve a lot of attention from this professional area. All of the theses are on the internet, are available to you. So after the conference, you will have ample opportunity to take a closer look at these theses. Let me start with the assessment of the thesis of Carmen Putinska. According to the panel, it's a very interesting research with a wonderful combination between theory and experiment. Experimentally, it was uh, very tough. We saw that on the video. And so she deserves a big compliment. Further investment in experimental methods seems, according to the uh, panel, and also in view of the theoretic substantiation, is going to be quite a challenge. And uh, that may or may not lead to further information on so smoldering. We looked at the depth of the vision and the conditions of the thesis. As most of the positive points, on the other hand, we also looked at the applicability, direct applicability of the thesis, and it's less of a topical issue. Um, if we look at Sander Dalbani's thesis, According to the panel, this is a topical issue. There's a great deal of interest for that. And in the opinion of the panel, there's a great need for further uh, information in this area, also on the basis of evaluations and assessments of large fires. It's very experimental, and there's a theoretical in-depth information regarding interaction, nature, and composition of the construction with the panels. And that would make the study even more valuable. The panel assesses the significance of the thesis um, as it's so great, it's a very topical issue, and the applicability is less strong in this thesis. Now, Roy Quillard's thesis, very well written, an excellent scientific piece of work, excellent quality. The panel assesses this thesis as the best one in this respect. It's very nice and interesting research with a uh, strong experimental nature, link between the physical and chemical 
uh, features of the construction material, according to the panel, could um, have a bit more added value? I remember there was a question in this respect earlier on. Let me see what else we can say about this. Could perhaps lead to further insight if there's more theory, and uh, this would um, add some depth to the conclusions. And scientific uh, content is uh, very much appreciated. And applicability is less of, uh, hasn't really achieved the level that we had envisaged. Presentation of David Ferrero, we haven't seen that. And this is considered to be a very scientific research of excellent quality. Positive is the combination between the simulations in practice, but it would have hoped for more focus on optimizing simulations. The problem could become very topical in the future because right now there's a debate on the combination between smoke and heat exhaust and sprinklers in fire safety. That's why it's a topical issue. Unfortunately, the results are so focused that there is no practical applicability for the time being. The approach, depth, and vision are the strongest point of the thesis and uh, there's less um, less of an unconventional element to it. So if we look at, uh, at all the members, I would like to invite the two candidates here to step up here to the stage, Sandra and Roy. The others, I would like to invite them as well, but I'm not going to be able to do it. Well, this is uh, exciting. I'm not going to keep up the suspense. That's uh, not good. Not good. So the panel has awarded fire behavior sandwich panel materials of Sandro Garbani, the Technical University of Eindhoven, uh, the winner of the thesis prize 2015, and will award him the award of 1,200 euros.